So we're now on to episode 4 of season 2, which is entitled Sleepless. And how does this fit into the X-Files legacy, Brian? Well, it's it's an episode that doesn't necessarily give us too much that you ha- that you have to count on in in the sense of the overall story. Although there you know there is the first meeting here with X, which we'll obviously get into. Um, but beyond that, the 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 main kind of villain of the week story itself isn't. It's not something that you have to see if, if you know, but. But it is a good one, I think. Um, it's it's an episode I certainly remember watching quite a lot back in my uh, full on X Files fervor. Um, and yeah, it, it's you know, and, and actually now thinking about it, th- there is a fair bit in this actually because mm-hmm. we get Crycheck as well introduced. So I'm talking rubbish. This let's just get into it. Cool. Let's just get into it. Sounds good to me. Yeah. Yeah, so the, the episode opens in New York City. A man is asleep on the couch. Or no, he's kind of dozing or, or, or mm. uh, watching TV. Smoke creeps under his door. He opens it to see a raging inferno. He calls for help and then he tries to fight it with the world's smallest uh, fire extinguisher that I've <laughs> ever seen. Um, I expected like say, foam snakes to come out of it or something. It was like one of those just jokey things. Um, firemen rush up the stairwell. Uh, they they pass by Candyman. Tony and, Todd. Yep. yep. <clears throat> and then who fa- has a uh, strange mark, a strange incision mark on the back of his neck. He, he, indeed, he does. And uh, the firemen make it to the, the guy's door. They burst open to find him dead against the wall with the fire extinguisher still in hand. Mm. No fire. No, no fire. trace of fire. Absolutely yep. nothing. Um, this, I didn't really know what was going on in this opening, but I'll tell you what, the, the, the firework was was immense. It looked like a raging inferno just tearing up the place. I, I loved it. It, just, it. it seemed so close to the actual actor. Almost better than that one in season one that we won't talk about. Uh, I, the one that I liked that you didn't. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I was going to ask, actually, did you get flashbacks to that episode? And clearly you did, because you just brought it up. But... Mm. Uh, yeah, I mean, I thought there was some really good firework in that episode as well, actually. But... There was, yeah. yeah. Um, but it, it just struck me as particularly good here. And, um, again, I don't know what the hell's going on. I know that I know that Candyman is up to no good because he's the Candyman. And um, there's you've obviously that question of why is there no fire? Yeah. What, you know, why is the guy against the wall with this fire extinguisher? What's going on? This is a case for Mulder and Scully. Yeah, indeed. Um, if one of them wasn't pregnant. <laughs> <laughs> Damn well during these pregnancies. Um, so we, we get, pretty much get the theme after that and then we're into uh, Mulder getting a newspaper through his front door, which has a tape in it, and the article is circled about the man dying in the fire. Mm. I, I, I don't know, did he play the tape in this... He, he plays. He plays it to Skinner. He plays so it to Skinner. The, yeah, just after this, we see it kind of cuts straight to him playing it to Skinner, and it <clears throat> points out that it isn't mentioned in the newspaper article about Grissom's death, um, like the the circumstances surrounding it. It just says that I don't know. He had a stroke or a heart attack or whatever, but nothing is mentioned of the phone call to the police, which mm. is on the tape. Um, and uh, Mulder also points out that Grissom had a number of government contractors, so technically that makes it FBI jurisdiction. Yeah, and it's quite obvious that he's, he's desperate for this case, and uh, Skinner kind of plays along, tells him we'll get back to him at some point, but he has tape duty, you know. Um, yeah, yeah. Sk- Skinner may as well be saying here, get back to your wiretaps, bitch, because... Yeah. That's pretty much what he says in all intents and purposes. Mm-hmm. But you do feel as if, and I'm unsure, still unsure about Skinner, but you get this feeling that he is actually listening to what Mulder says, but he's got him on an extremely short lease. You know, he, he yeah. wants him to do what he's been told to do, but he is willing to listen to him if he has a point. Um, yeah. So I'm kind of leaning in the camp where I'm kind of favouring Skinner a little bit. He, he doesn't. Yeah. He doesn't come across as bad as like a uh, smoking man or anything like that. Obviously, you know where it goes from here. Um, but for yeah, me, yeah. I'm, I'm kind of liking him a bit more. Yeah, yeah. I, th- I, th- I think that's the right gut reaction to have. Really, like, I it, mean, like I've said before, he's 
it, it's not that Skinner is de deliberately trying to undermine Mulder. It's it's just that he's by the book. He mm -hmm. wants to do things by the book. He wants Mulder to conduct himself professionally, and he in turn conducts himself professionally. You know, he's he's an assistant director. He's got his role, and he knows what Mulder's role should be. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think if, if I was to describe them, the best would probably be firm but fair. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think that's, that's enough. So we, we kind of move on to the next screen uh, scene where Mulder is transcribing tapes and an agent so comes in, hands Mulder a file and says that, that the investigation has been approved and this is Krychek. Yay! Um, yeah, yes, <laughs> um, I have a, a, a rough memory of this guy and uh, I know he becomes sort of a nemesis and Black Goo becomes part of it. <laughs> yes, in, in one of my favourite episodes actually which you're referencing there but uh, we'll get to that in season three. Um oh, is that season three? Yeah, yeah. Right, yeah. right, okay, okay. Yeah. So um, they mentioned the extinguisher but there was no uh, phone call. Crycheck mentions that he's green but... Um, he does iterate to Mulder that this is his case he had at first, so he's willing to work with Mulder, and Mulder yeah. re reluctantly agrees to this. Or so it seems. Yeah. Um, <laughs> he, t he tells Krychek, OK, OK, fair enough. Tell you what, you go and get the car, mm -hmm. and I'll meet you downstairs. <laughs> and that's when he, he does a runner and just leaves him to it. Yeah. Yeah, uh, may as well send him up the stairs for a bucket of steam or a yeah, long stand. Pretty much. Um, mm -hmm. So, cry check. I know where he goes, but I didn't know where he came from. I can't remember that. So I just took it as face value for what mm. the guy's saying. You know, obviously it comes later on in the episode. There's a, a twist that, which I'm, I'm going to say right now, didn't see coming. <laughs> 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 you didn't. I did not see it coming at all. I was just taking you... it all at face value. Really? Really. I couldn't remember that part of it at all. So all the way through this it's... episode, I'm taking Crycheck as just a green recruit. Wow. So you saw, you thought he was on the level? Yes. Wow. Okay. No, he's... Yeah, he's rat boy from the start, basically. Yeah. Um... I, I, I mean, obviously talking about it now, I've seen the episode, but during it... I had no idea at all. <laughs> I, I think that's the, just down to one to the way he's written and two to the way he's played by Nicholas Lee. Um, I think he does a, a really good job of convincing us that he is just this wet behind the ears, or as he puts it, a little green, um, kind of new, newish recruit to the FBI. So, mm -hmm. yeah, um, crack it, crack him. I think I'd say. <laughs> yeah. so, so we go back to the FBI Academy where Scully is teaching yet again. She has mm -hmm. a, cord, a, a call sorry, from George Hale uh, yeah. and, and Mulder is going to send her a body. Yeah. And you, you, rem you remember the George Hale reference, I take yes. it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, okay. And it's, it's the doctor um, that, that, that died in the fire, that, that's whose body they're sending, isn't it? Yeah, <clears throat> yeah so yes. Gr Grissom, yeah. Um, so Mulder goes to the sleep disorder centre and, and gets a tour of the place as it seems to happen a lot isn't it, there's just one person that just seems to <laughs> give them all this kind of information um, Basil you know, Exposition I believe they call them uh, um, yeah so th this is a sleep disorder centre that Grissom this, this guy who died in the fire basically <clears throat> ran it was his centre, he, he was doing research into sleep disorders trying to figure out how to help people with them and whatnot. Um, and as you say, Mulder speaks to a woman who tells him that theoretically it's possible to alter someone's dreams. Hmm. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> you kind of know where it's headed at that point. Um, <clears throat> so outside of the building, Krychek is fairly pissed off and argues with Mulder. Uh, and kind of Scully calls about a cause of death. So, mm. uh, a little bit of information here. Krychek may be green, but he kind of stands his ground. Um, and yeah, I think yeah. he actually makes Mulder listen as well. Yeah. Um, you know. Well, he, he appeals to 
what little vanity Mulder has, I suppose. You know, yes. he, he says that there are some of us back at the academy who believe in your work, and it's not it's not so much that Mulder's vain. Um, you know, it's a bad turn of phrase, I guess. It's it's just that he wants so badly to have people listen to what he has to say, to to, mm-hmm. to his beliefs, to his wacky theories. So. When someone comes on board who is kind of the antithesis to Scully, who, who's who's very eager and willing to listen to what crackpot theories he's got to spout out, mm. yeah, that, that that's obviously going to get a rise out of him. It, it piques his, his interest mm. in Krychek, and he starts to warm to him in that moment. And, and I think you have as well, you've got Mulder, who's a, a trained profiler, one of the best in the business, and, mm. you know, if, if anybody could smell a rat, you would imagine it would be him, but... He gets knocked on his back foot by this person saying, like, you know what, I, I do believe. Mm. You know, it just completely throws him as well. I kind of like that. Um, yeah. that it's Mulder's weakness, isn't it? It's, oh, it's something yeah. that's cropped up throughout this series, which is that actually the, the best way to attack Mulder is, is through his willingness to attach himself to anyone who is willing to believe in him or to believe in what he... Is, is fighting for, is trying to search for. Um, mm. um, so we, we go to Scully doing the autopsy. Um, and and Krychek looks a bit ill looking at the body. <laughs> um, it, but Scully says that the body shows signs of fire, intense heat. Um, it's all the secondary signs of being in a fire, but no primary burning outside. Uh, and as she says, it's as if his body believed it was burning. Mm. Yeah, I got, I got to say as well, just seeing Krychek turn like that and kind of look look like he's getting a bit ill. Uh, yeah, where his character goes throughout the series and what you might imagine the, the, the things he's seen throughout his life, he's putting that on. That is all performance. He does not feel ill at all. Yeah, I mean, even at the end of the episode, if if you realise this person is. A skilled in, in covert tactics, then mm. um, there is absolutely no way that's the first time we've seen a body. Yeah, everything that comes out of his mouth is lies, and it, even his body language, it's all designed to to make him appear green, to make him appear like a fresh recruit, and he is anything but. Yep, so we, we jump to uh, Brooklyn, New York. Another man is watching TV. He has a matching scar on his neck, uh, the same as Candyman. And he's sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's such an iconic character, Brian. <laughs> yeah. Poor Tony Tom. <clears throat> yes, uh, or he's also called Preacher, isn't he? Yeah, yeah, Preacher. Preacher, yeah. yeah. It, he's like um, it's funny actually because I, I I put a question out there to bearded movie guy over on YouTube, a friend of mine on YouTube. Uh, the other day, I was I was asking him. Uh, he wanted some questions for the show he did, and I. I asked him to name some of his favourite Christian movie characters, and he, he, he was a bit a uh, bit rough on it. He didn't, he didn't quite. I, I didn't think he'd quite thought it through, but he, he did make a, a really good point about war movies, which is that you always get the stereotypical guy <laughs> in the platoon who's the Bible quoter. He usually goes by the name of Preacher as a nickname. Yeah. And it's yeah, so so true. He Tony Todd in this episode is that guy. He is the yeah. guy in the platoon who was called preacher and spouts off biblical quotes uh, about damnation and goodness knows what else. Uh, yeah, hit the nail on the head. Yeah, I, I'd never actually thought about that trope before, but now you mention it, it's it's so on the nose. <laughs> it's, it's like like Fury. I mean, I'm thinking of Fury now um, with uh, Shia LaBeouf's character. <laughs> yeah. That's who he was in that, and and there's so many more. You know, Platoon, um, the uh, Stanley Kubrick one, Full Metal Jacket. I'm sure there was someone in that who did. It's just it is. It's a proper trope of your, uh, particularly your Vietnam kind of. I'm, I'm set pretty sure is, is there not one in Predator as well? One yeah. Of guys. <laughs> <laughs> just, any army guys will just throw in one that's religious. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. So we're we're with you. Um, yeah, yeah, the guy's watching TV. A preacher appears in front of him or at his door and kind of talks to him for a little bit about things that have happened in the past, about things that they did 
during the war. So you get a kind of hint to a backstory to what, what's causing yeah. this guy to go on a rampage. And then he, the, the man starts to see dead Vietnamese uh, people yeah. um, with automatic weapons. Yeah, you, you, you basically you get the sense. I mean, it's never explicitly told, but it's it's fairly obvious that these are most likely the victims of some heinous crime that he committed during his time in Vietnam. Um, it, yeah, I, I, it feels like he's see, seeing visions or ghosts of the past that are coming back to haunt him. Um, or as 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 preacher puts it, coming back to. Uh, for justice, really, because he said he says we all have to pay for what we did over there. Mm. So that's really the line that gives away the fact that yeah, these these are the ghosts of his past coming yeah. back for vengeance. Pretty much, and then the the thing the zombies raise their weapons, shoot and kill the guy. Um, it's mm. quite a it's it's quite a visceral scene, you know. It's, it's in your face. Yeah. Um, yeah. I quite like. The well, idea well, of well it. yeah. I mean, while while they're killing him, while they're firing all these their bullets at him you've got preacher off to the side quoting these lines of scripture about god washing away their iniquities so it's it's real yeah it's really effective really foreboding mm. and just yeah very well filmed i think oh yeah it's terrific looking so then we jump to Crycheck talking through the man's death and gunshot wounds and Mulder questions the scar on his neck and somebody mentions that he was a marine uh, and then we kind of jump to the FBI library. Well, yeah, I mean, the 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 evidence is that it looks like a gun. It looked like a gunshot wound. Yeah. Um, and Crycheck and Mulder figure out. Yeah, they they figure out that Grissom and Willig, who is the guy who who was just killed served together in Vietnam, so mm -hmm. that gets them on, on the hunt, basically, for the rest of whoever was in their unit. Yeah. Um, and it turns out that there was only one survivor left from that team uh, that, that they served in, and that, that guy is Augustus Cole, otherwise known as Preacher, otherwise known as Tony Todd, otherwise known as Candyman. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> um. So, so they go to visit him at this point, isn't it? Yes. Yeah, they, go, they go to visit him. Um, yeah, because, uh, I mean, we're not told this. We're, we're only told this by the fact that they are going to visit. Um, yeah, in, in like, fact, I didn't even pick up that it was the same guy until after they said that he'd escaped. Yeah. So so it's like you're, you're kind of... You're, you're being asked to play catch-up here. So mm. if, if, if you're not paying attention... You can kind of easily get lost <laughs> in this episode, yeah. And it's not like the information isn't there. It's not like that. That it's not like it's badly written in that sense. Um, it's just actually it's, it is well written, and they move from scene to scene uh, very sparingly. The the, mm -hmm. the 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 expositional kind of scenes that, that, that are the way they give exposition is done very well because they they expect you the audience to keep up with their pace. They're, they're always two steps ahead and we're having to kind of keep up with them. Um, but, yeah, they so they go to see um, a doctor that I can only describe as Dr Chilton from Silence of the Lambs. He has yeah. that proper jo Dr Chilton vibe. They may as well have got that same actor in, quite frankly, I wish they to play had. in. Uh, that would have been fantastic. And, and just <laughs> literally call him Dr Chilton. Um, but, yeah, so apparently... Cole is locked up in this place, um, presumably yes. because he had some kind of sleep disorder, but also, uh, I mean, he's he's been confined, solitary confinement, because apparently he can interfere with people's dreams. And when Mulder quizzes the Doctor on this, there is no reply. No. Um, and then just after that, they open the door to discover that Cole is missing. Um, but it's a very nice scene. It, it kind of leads to more questions and gives you that kind of nice idea of this guy just messing with people, <laughs> pretty mm. much. Yeah, I mean, it, it's because I like that actually they don't show you how he got out. They give you just enough pieces to kind of 
put some vague picture together of how he got out. You, you don't always need to see it. We know what his power is, or we're certainly starting to get an inkling of what his power is. Um, so, yeah, so just having these few tidbits of information builds a picture in your mind without having to see it play out. Yeah, because the, the next person they see, the nurse tells him that Cole signed, uh, was signed out by the doctor a couple of days prior. Yeah. Uh, which the doctor quite vehemently argues against, but then we know better. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, so then we... Um, oh, I've got him down his deep throat too, but you, you see his name's X. Yeah, he becomes known as X, um, and, and that's... Is he, Deep Throat has been called Deep Throat by Mulder, so we so that's why we know mm. him as Deep Throat. X never officially gets called X, but in later episodes when Mulder wants to call him, he will use an X, kind of like a bat symbol, um, in order to call him. So that's really why he becomes known as X. Um, right. um, and and I... I mean, I, I knew this guy as soon as he popped on camera. I know him from, uh, what is it, the final Friday, Jason Goes to Hell? Yes, Jason Goes to Hell. Yes, he's the wacky bounty hunter from yeah. Jason Goes to Hell. Yeah. Mm. So he likes breaking fingers. Yeah, he likes breaking fingers. <laughs> instantly, since I saw him, I was like, yes! I know him. <laughs> um, so he meets him in a construction site, and the guy gives him a, gives Mulder a folder and tells him, that sleep is a soldier's greatest enemy. Cut out all the sleep together. And then they, they go and have a little discussion, and then he says, closing the X-Files and separating you and Scully was just the beginning. And mm. it's, it's a nice little scene, because the guy obviously are, it appears to not want to be there. Yeah. Um, and it's almost as if by some <clears throat> kind of duty that he's, he's helping out. Yeah. It, it's like... Is is that sense of duty to Deep Throat and because he passed away? Or is somebody else pulling the strings? And if somebody else is pulling the strings, is it to divert Mulder or to help Mulder? And it's just so you, you never really know with this guy, you know? Is he friend or foe? And he is definitely a very different character to Deep Throat, you know? Yeah. He's... He feels a lot more dangerous. He feels like someone you wouldn't want to cross or get on the bad side of. Um, you know, Deep Throat felt like much more of a intellectual type. This guy, while he he's obviously going to have some nouns about him, feels like he's a bit of a scrapper as well. Um, but uh, yeah, you get a you get a lot of a, you get a, a big sense of his personality just from this one scene. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and I definitely. really like the. Really like the way this scene's shot as well. Now, the director of this episode, Rob Bowman, he would go on to direct the first X Files movie, um, and he, he does have a very cinematic style. It's it's easy to see why they chose him for the movie because this scene, if you look at this scene, and like like we said before, the way he orchestrated that scene in which Willig got killed when he was mm -hmm. shot. But I, this scene feels really cinematic. The location helps, but the way the camera opens up on it and it kind of pans, it, it kind of pans in slowly, um, creeps in slowly, and he kind of overlooks this this balcony of this what looks like a, an abandoned or work in progress stadium. It does. It feels very cinematic. Um, so yeah, I like the way it's shot. Yeah, I think does it not leave by pulling back? from the meeting through the... Yeah, yeah, it's book-ended. So it it, it, st it ends the way it started, which is kind of like a reversal shot. But you feel at the end as if somebody's watching them. You never see mm. anybody, but the way it pulls back out, you're like, somebody's definitely keeping an eye on these guys, or that's the way it feels anyway. Yeah, yeah. The camera work feels very intentional, um, and that's that's what I like about it. Ah, uh, um, and also, Rob Bowman directed the uh, Rain of Fire. A movie I really liked. Yes, 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 he did. Uh, quite an underrated movie, I think. Yeah. Um, a yeah. missold movie is what yes. I would say. I think I think people went into that film wanting what they saw on the posters, mm. which was <laughs> a shed load of dragons and all-out war. It isn't that film, but once you get past that, once you get past. The fact that it's not the the poster, it's still a really satisfying film, I think. Yeah, McConaughey's Van Zandt's terrific. I love yes, that guy. Yes. 
And there's still some pretty decent dragon action in it, i got to say, once there you is. get to the end. There is. So, um, so we're really... Um, so, yeah, Mulder, Mulder picks up Krychek, who tells him someone... Um, Fitting Cole's description just robbed the yeah. drugstore. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, <laughs> and the police have him cornered. Um, so Krychek and Mulder get there on the scene. There's gunshots... Um, two officers get shot Cole's gone and then Krychek says that the two officers seemingly have shot each other they do yeah but just before we get into that there's just one in, one element that was quite important which is that Mulder stashes the file that he's just picked up from X yeah. under the seat of his car and just after that Krychek shiftily asks him where he's been. Or more to the point, Mulder shiftily avoids answering. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Um, yeah, which definitely comes into play later on. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, so, so at the hotel, uh, the, these police officers apparently seem to have shot each other. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Um, so Mulder makes a report about cutting out the soldier's sleep. And he calls Scully, uh, tells her his theory about the telepathic images, dreams, and uh, Krychek is wanting to go and question another soldier. And it's almost treated like like Mulder and Scully have broken up, and, and, and Mulder's talking about his, uh, his new partner, and Scully's mm, kind of yeah. jilted and jealous about <laughs> it. Or at least that's, that's what I read through this whole scene. I thought it was quite funny. Um, yeah, it is. It's 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 very much that kind of. Um, oh no, is 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 he having an affair? And yeah. th- and there is a lot of kind of homoerotic um, kind of vibes, I think, between uh, Krychek and Walder, particularly when we get into Dwayne Barry, which obviously yeah. we'll, we'll get into next week. But um, all right, okay. Um, <laughs> I, I just I just thought it was like funny interplay. Um, just yes, the yeah, looks definitely. and the way they were talking, it just it made me giggle a little bit. Um, it felt like Mulder <laughs> was cheating on Scully, didn't it? It certainly did, and it felt as if yeah. he, Scully felt a little bit jilted. You know, yeah, 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 your new partner sounds awesome. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so so Scully has called Mulder, obviously, um, but uh, it turns out that Cole robbed the drugstore in order to replenish his serotonin levels, which are usually replenished during sleep. Mm-hmm. Um, so obviously that suggests that perhaps this guy does not sleep. He, he is permanently awake. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, so from there, Mulder and Krychek head to see this guy called Salvatore Matola, I think it is, uh, and he's a survivor whose name was given to Mulder by X in the files that he gave to him. Um, And Sal sits down with them, tells them that they made up missions of their own when they were in Nam. Basically, they they were a crack team that were put together, experimented on, uh, to the point where they no longer needed to sleep. Mm. So, basically, the perfect soldier. If, If you're a soldier and you don't need to sleep... You can you can literally wait until the other guy is asleep, go in, wipe him out. But this kind of behaviour went on for so long that they all essentially ended up becoming a little bit deranged and started making up their own missions, killing women, kill, killing children, and, yeah, basically just going a little bit... Well, not a little bit, fully <laughs> off the rails. <laughs> yeah, fully off the rails. It sounds... Sounds very interesting. It paints a picture. Uh, definitely it does. paints a picture in your mind. Mm. Uh, what do you uh, think of this guy, this this actor that that's playing this this Salvatore? I, I thought it was good. I, I like the fact that he's, he's he looks. Like the red eyes are kind of like mm. a, a predominant statement. Um, I, I kind of like him. I feel like he's being honest. He, he looks like he's trying to get his life back on track. Type of thing. I just. Mm. Um, I, I thought I, 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 can't, I can't remember the name of the actor I have seen him in things before but I thought I his think. performance here was terrific absolutely terrific <laughs> like there's there's a he's very sketchy very kind of twitchy and just you can tell this dude hasn't slept for 30 years you know mm-hmm. it's like 
when he goes walking off to the kitchen because they ask if he can have a word with him and he kind of picks up his tray and starts walking off to the kitchen and he's still kind of talking to himself it's it's like he's answering them but he's not answering them he's he's mm. he's muttering to himself and he just yeah he looks like someone who hasn't slept in ages he acts like someone who hasn't slept in ages and i just think the performance is absolutely spot on mm. yeah. yeah can't argue with that there at all mm. um, so they're on the expressway Mulder and Crychek are in the car. It's the well, well, uh, for, well. First, he he gives. They get information from this guy um, that that it was uh, yeah, Grissom. And yeah, Grissom and Girardi are Girardi. the doctors that made them what they are. So obviously, this this now gives them another person yeah. <laughs> to track to track down who is is going to be an obvious target for call. Yeah. So I think they're on their way there. They're on the expressway. Mulder and Crychek are in the car. It's the twenty fourth anniversary of the massacre when the killing started. Uh, uh, Gerard Gerardy, whatever his name is. <laughs> <laughs> Somehow they know that he's coming to Grissom's funeral. Um, well, well it's, the, the thing the thing is, it's um, it's Mulder's profiling. Um, this this scene I really like because it shows Mulder doing what he does best, which is profiling. And, you know, again, he's he's taken Scully's advice because Scully told him that actually his next best move would be to profile Augustus Cole, profile mm-hmm. preacher. And that's what he's doing in this guy. It's like, well, OK, what's, what's his mindset? And his mindset is that he sees himself as an avenging angel, avenging the atrocities that his platoon committed during their time in Nam. Um, so, w- w- the uh, the anniversary, is, as you pointed out, of of those massacres is coming up. Um, mm. So, that that's kind of where Mulder is thinking. What what's the link there with the anniversary? And it, and it turns out there is going to be this um, celebrate. Oh, I don't want to call it celebration, but a a, a, commem- yeah, a commemoration, so to speak, uh-huh. of of the event, and that doctor guy is going to be there. So that would be the most logical place that that um, Cole is going to target in order to try and find this guy. Mm-hmm. Um, so if if you can find this guy, if you know where he's going to come in, obviously which train station he's going to come in, that would be the most obvious place Cole is going to pick him up. Mm-hmm. And that is the Bronx station, and Mulder and Crouchet do their best running acting as they run into the station. They run about crazy looking for um, any sign of this guy. And Candyman always happens to be there as well. There's some tense chase music uh, as as Mulder tries to lock in on his target just as uh, Preacher steps out and shoots him in the back and then shoots Mulder. Yeah. And, it's... Uh, and, it, and it brings us to... Probably my only complaint with the episode, um, which is that so far all the visions we've had um, have have killed the people. Uh, you know, we we even saw the the one guy who was killed with gunfire, imaginary gunfire, mm-hmm. and and the point is that this guy can project images so powerful in the mind that they je- that they actually kill. Um, and Mulder's been shot here, you know. And and if if we if we'd have seen like him wearing a vest or something like that, a bulletproof vest, I'd be okay with it. But he clearly gets shot, and then he's kind of just woken up by Krychek. So he doesn't have that same kind of psychological, physical effect that the other victims have had. Um, so t- that to me would be my one complaint with well, the episode. Let me what, just, what about I, I'll help you in that one a little bit. Even if he was wearing a bulletproof vest, it wouldn't help him because all the damage is done internally and not externally. So, you know, because when somebody's shot in the mind, there's no external damage to the body, it's only internal damage. Yeah, no, but if, if you believe that you've been shot in the chest and you know yourself to be wearing a bullet a bulletproof vest then psychologically <laughs> you, because that, that I mean that's what this is isn't it it's, it's, if you can you, project you're it, imagining you can... The, this could be like the fight at the end of Sherlock Holmes 2 where the two guys <laughs> don't actually do anything it's just a battle in the mind yes pretty much um, but I, I don't know it's like 
like I say, it's 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 not a huge complaint. Um, I mean, he it, he only gets shot once, so he, even if you only get shot once, you, you can still survive. It's just it's a little bit hazy, is all I'm saying. Mm. Is that all the other victims, you know, wh when they got shot in their mind, they they got shot. Period, mm. and it just yeah. It doesn't, doesn't seem to be any explanation as to why Mulder didn't have the same effects physically as the other people who, who'd had this kind of thing done to them. Yeah, yeah that's a fair point. I hadn't actually picked up on that, that, that part, but um, yeah, it's ruined the full episode for me, Brian. <laughs> <laughs> so we've got Mulder and Crycheck. They're in the CCTV room, um, and Crycheck tells Mulder that he's covered for him mm. and, and he wants to believe. Yeah. You know, in, in hindsight, it, it, it seems a bit like um, pushing just all of Mulder's buttons. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Big time. Big time. <laughs> he, he wants to know... What, I mean, because... Let, let's not forget, uh, although Krychek is cle clearly a double agent, um, as, you know, as we find out at the end of this, he still doesn't know what's going on mm. With Cole, uh -huh. you know, this, th th he still has to work this case the same way any FBI agent would. Um, and he, the, the fact that he does work with Cancer Man, the fact that he probably has seen things you people wouldn't believe, to quote um, <laughs> Rutger Hauer in Blade Runner, uh, is, I've uh, yes, yes, <laughs> I've seen things you people wouldn't believe. Anyway, um, yeah, it, it, you know, he still needs to get to grips with this case. Yeah. And... I think, in many respects, he probably does believe what Mulder believes. He probably does believe that Mulder, you know, a lot a lot of Mulder's kind of crackpot theories are actually true because he's probably one of the guys who's covered up half the stuff that Mulder's tried to prove. So, so yeah, I, I think he he would maybe does want a genuine explanation from Mulder as to what he thinks is going on, mm -hmm. but only so that, that he can then cover it up, hide it, or, or you know, whatever. Yeah. So he's, he's always double-dealing, that's yeah. the thing. So Cole has his man, and he's kind of talking to him about things that have happened, and then you can hear this sound in the background of, of somebody coming closer, um, an eye for an eye, and uh, Mulder and Krychek are driving. We're looking for the, the missing car that they noticed in the CCTV cameras when they hear mm -hmm. screams and they rush to investigate. Yeah. Uh, and they get there just to find glasses lying in the ground along with a little bit of blood. It's a nice, a nice kind of spooky image. Mm. And um, they find the still live body of uh, Gerardi. Yeah. Which is a uh, strange. Cole never got to finish his work. You know, you <laughs> kind of think he would uh, had somebody just pop up and stab him in the throat or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's just uh... yeah, he kind of gets off the hook a little bit. Mm. So I think the two guys, uh, the t well, Mulder chases after Cole and gets him at the edge of a precipice where Cole just looks down. He's he's got his Bible in his hand. And he asks to be shot. He's tired. He, he feels right. as if he thinks he's, he's finished what he set out to achieve. Maybe he doesn't yeah. know that Jardy's still alive. Maybe, Maybe he thinks that he's done enough to kind of take him out. But it's a, it's a sort of sombre, quiet end to this episode, you know? M it is, yeah. Yeah, you know, Mulder doesn't want to shoot him. And Cole doesn't Cause, want cause to go on. I, th I think it's in Tony Todd's performance that actually, you, I mean, despite the atrocities this guy has committed, you do kind of feel sorry for him. You, 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 and I think a lot of that comes from the fact that you also genuinely feel that he has remorse, not for killing his platoon, but for what he did with his platoon uh, back in the day. Yeah. yeah um, obviously, that's why, that's why he's doing what he's doing. But, yeah, so I think... Again, because of the way it's written and because of Tony Todd's performance, I, I at any rate, kind of felt a little bit of sympathy for this guy. I, I, yeah. Mm -hmm. I was almost in his corner. Yeah, I mean, Mulder's <laughs> trying to talk to him, trying to get him to, like, you know, not to harm himself, to testify against what's been done to him, but you can kind of tell that Cole's been down a path. He's weary. He's, he is tired, even though he'll never yeah. sleep, he'll never rest, he wants to rest. Yeah, and if he knows that that's death, then that's, he's made his, his, 
he's promised with that, he's happy with it, he's willing to accept it. Mm. Um, and, and as Mulder's talking to him, Krychek comes up behind him with the gun, uh, aimed squarely at Cole, and Cole makes Krychek see the Bible as a gun. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, he sees the Bible as a weapon, which I suppose some people have used it as that before. Yeah. It's, it's, some, ni- it's some nice symbology, I think. Yeah, um, very good. I, I quite like that yeah. moment. Um, yeah. And Krychek shoots. Mulder screams no and tries to stop him, but it's, it's, it's too late. And uh, Krychek looks for the gun. There's no gun, just the Bible lying there. And he's like, I've seen a gun, I've seen a gun. Mulder's just like, yeah. Mm. Yeah. Um, you kind of get a look from Mulder as well that he's not disappointed with Krychek or angry with Krychek. He, he, he understands. Yeah. He's he's like I, I know this guy made you see something, I right, so don't worry about it, mate. I I get it. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a nice moment, but um, it would have been curious to see how it had played with hindsight if you never see um, what Krychek sees. You know, like a, mm. a gun in. Yeah, in yeah, yeah. Side, like because when you at the end and you get the reveal with Krychek, yeah. it would have put a little bit of. Uh, dubiousness on that scene. Yeah, it, it de- absolutely. Yeah, yeah. but I, but I, I also think that y- you would lose something though by by doing that as well because I, I do like as you know as you said the the symbology of that the Bible turning into a gun. You know, some people use it for peace, some people use it for an excuse for war. So um, yeah, it's, uh, it's it's a nice moment. I, I, as, as I agree with you on that. I think I'd rather it be there than it didn't. To be fair. Um, so Mulder goes to the car and the file's been removed. He's uh, also had, or Scully's had all her reports stolen. Um, does nobody back anything up? <laughs> I mean, seriously. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> and uh, Mulder tells Scully about his meeting with the uh, ex. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, which is a, a nice little moment. It's just, it's still got that, he's, you know, he's, he's had his uh, fun on the side and he's went back to Scully. And he's still telling her everything. And then we get the final scene, the little sting in the tail. The smoking yep. man is being briefed by Krychek, who says that Scully has a problem. Um, and the smoking man yep. says that every problem has a solution. It's a very uh-huh. dark ending, I would say. And it leaves you yep. with a little bit of dread and a little bit of worry for what's going to happen to our leads. And mm. like a a partic- th- Well, particularly Scully, yeah, given that, right, com- it's, it's, that it's, comment. It's a thoroughly veiled <coughs> threat. Um, mm. Which you know really gets to me because as we discovered, I'm, I'm very much a Scully person. <laughs> um, yeah. And like I said, this was a reveal to me. I didn't see this coming. This was a shock. Mm. Um, yeah. That, that, that I was just like, wow. Because um, mm. I know kind of roughly where Krychek ends up, but I couldn't remember his beginnings in this. I did not see coming, so it was a, a very nice and it, it kind of repurposes the episode for me when I think back talking about it now, uh, sort of thing. So yeah. What did you think about this scene at the end, Brian? I lo- yeah, I loved it. I think um, <coughs> I mean I I always remember it from when they the, the first time I ever saw it, and I think I I was probably like you to be honest. I I probably didn't think Krychek was even going to be a, a character that would be in the series that long. I thought you know they'd probably get a, a few episodes out of him, two, three at the most, and he'd probably get shot or something. You know, as a, as a bit of a a partner who's just too green, too wet behind the ears. So, I, I do. I think, like you said, I think you take that at face value, and I think it's helped by the performance. Because, like throughout this episode, uh, Nicholas Lee never plays it with a kind of knowing wink, wink. Hey, I'm I'm secretly a bad guy. You know, there's, there's no kind of long looks after sentences where you can read something in that oh he's actually thinking something else no they just they play it straight down the line this is just this guy is who you, who he look who he appears to be and then it's just right at the end boom kick between the nuts no he's he's a double agent yeah, yeah right it's supposed to be a bit of any wrap ups yeah I'll, I'll jump off with this one I kind of like this episode. I had a lot of fun with it. I like some of the imagery that's on show here, the, the fire or the Vietnamese firing squad, things like that. I, I like Krychek being in the mix and having a partner that um, wants to believe. Uh, I, I like this aspect. aspect. I like when X comes into it because it's building up that 
um, conspiracy theory thing again, which I really like from the first season. Um, and it's got lots of things like that that I really do enjoy. But the main story, the, the, the soldiers, isn't that compelling or that great. Everything else around about is terrific, but the kind of bulk of the story wasn't super appealing. Um, and I think if if we didn't have the cry checked aspect or, or the, the X or whatever, or the, it would probably bring the episode down a little bit. But overall, I still thought it was a, a really interesting episode, which I was curious as to where it was going to go. Uh, and overall, I gave it four out of five. Okay. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I slightly differ with you because because I do actually find the story of the. Uh, I, I mean, yeah, you, know, you, you you get a character in there who's quoting Bible quotes left, right, and centre. I'm obviously going to be intrigued in some way, <laughs> but uh, it's just a tick that box. Um, no, it, I I just I do I like this character. I like the idea of him. This fact that he sees himself as this avenging angel. I do like the story centred around this unit and how the information comes out. And I think the performances from these people, you know, the, the, again, particularly that guy in the uh, that they go to see at the restaurant, the guy who works there and he gives them the information. Um, you know, if you go back, watch that scene again and just watch his performance, it is really, really well done. Uh, very nuanced, I think. Um, and and like I say, they, they they do make me feel sympathy for the bad guy towards the end of this. But then on top of that, yeah, you do have all this stuff with Krychek, all this stuff with X, and things feel like they're heating up a bit, you know. Um, so yeah, I, I I was I was torn on this one. I I I, I think I came this close to actually going full on five out of five, but. In the end, for whatever reason, call it the, uh, the 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 one little quibble I had with Mould getting shot but not getting shot. I, I'll give this a four and a half out of five. Right. Yeah, I, I think I'd, I'd maybe I had an issue myself if we gave it a five. Um, mm-hmm. I don't think it's it's not up there with Ice or Squeeze. No. Or Beyond no, the Sea. No. Episodes that all got a five. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and as we stand just now, it's it's hard to picture an episode in this season going to match up to any of those but you no, know, we're still mm. young in this uh, season yeah. so as we move on to the next episode which is Dwayne Barry uh, is this one like, predominant, is this, is this a big episode? This is a huge episode yeah, within, within X-Files mythology this is yeah, if, if Earl, Earl and Meyer Flask is where the whole mythology arc kicked off this is where it steps into gear. Um, a lot of the stuff that is going to happen happen in Dwayne Barry and 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 the the second episode because it is a two part episode um, is is going to shape where the X Files goes for for many years to come. Um, but uh, yeah, and and I think I, I've got a sneaking suspicion it may be our first five out of five of the season. But we'll, we'll I'll have to. Have to view it again. Sit down, watch it, get into it. See if that, see if that still holds up. Um, but I'd be very interested to hear your thoughts on this one. Excellent. So we'll see you next time on the X Files Revisited for Episode Five, Dwayne Barry. <laughs>